This is the podcast version of the seminar all about presenting your notated music. As you know, we have a textbook, Behind Bars by Elaine Gould, and a lot of what we refer to is contained in this book. So if you don't have this already, get yourself a copy. It's the set text for first year. Either that or go and borrow a copy in the library. So why should we bother about what our music looks like? Well, first impressions are very important. Good presentation leads to better readability. And this then leads to a better use of your rehearsal time. A more efficient use of your rehearsal time means a better performance of your music. If you're sorting out notation issues in your rehearsal and notation is getting in the way, then obviously there is a problem with your presentation and with your notation. So this is the main reason why we need our music to look right. So it's interesting to think about what technology has been available to composers in the past. And really it's been pretty basic. It's just been pen and paper. Here is an autograph by Handel. You can see the figured bass and the string parts above. It's not bad writing actually. It, you can still kind of work it out even, even today. Here is uh, an, an autograph by Beethoven and it's slightly more messy as you can see. Uh, sort of got a spontaneity about it though. And all the information was in there that the publishers then had to decipher and then make the published version from there. Here is Brahms, and you can see that uh, this is a symphonic piece. And uh, again, it's, it's kind of, kind of clear, um, and there's an, enough information for the publisher to then make the fair copy of this. You can see that Brahms has scratched things out, he's made some mistakes. So if Brahms can make some mistakes, then it's all right for the rest of us to do that. Going forward a bit further in time, here is a piece by George Crumb. It's one of his macrocosmos. These are the most beautiful scores, and as you can see, there's a, you know, a high degree of graphic art involved. This is not using computers. This is all using uh, beautiful calligraphy. And in fact, computers will find it very difficult to come up with something as beautiful as this. You might have to come up with a, a kind of a graphic arts program rather than a notation program to achieve something like this and uh, you need to turn around the score to make sense of it. And uh, these are beautiful compositions to look at. And there's always a, a good reason for the reason that they, they look like this. There's a particular conception behind these pieces of music. So check out those Macrocosmos by George Crumb. So we need to think of scores and parts today and what they're used for. And what sort of situations do you need to produce high quality, well presented scores for? Well, it's a pretty easy answer, isn't it? For most things, we need high quality, well presented scores. Um, apart from maybe some first initial workshop things where you might present something more sketchy, um, something a little bit more rough would be okay for a workshop. But when we get into a rehearsal situation where there is very little time, then of course we really need to have the best looking scores that are available for us. Now here's a little a little exercise for you. So write down on a bit of paper these this little grid. Okay, what are the advantages of handwritten versus the computer? Handwritten advantages, handwritten disadvantages, computer notated advantages and disadvantages. You can pause this recording while you write a few of these things down. I'm not actually going to give you some answers. I'm interested to know what you would like to write. So attention to detail. Being fussy will pay off. So firstly, the design and your layout of your score are important. And secondly, the content what goes on the page, and how much detail. So here is a design rule. Avoid collisions, they are dangerous. So for example, this document, this slide, there are lots of problems here. 
here, for example. Stay is too close. Dynamics markings above the stay. Let's highlight all of them. So let's see what we can do about it. Here is a before and after shot. That's much better. Down here we have more space. The dynamics are better presented. You can see the temper marks above. This spacing is better on a horizontal level. Here is a little mistake still. That needs to be moved down. But overall, it's much better. So you need to think about what paper you're going to use. Is it going to be landscape? Is it going to be portrait? If you're writing for vocal scores, never, never use landscape. It's just not used. You need to use portrait. So finding out what the conventions are. There are different paper sizes as well. So for a large orchestral score, you might print on A3. A4 is okay for um, chamber sized pieces. And then orchestral parts are done on B4. Okay, so think about size, quality, and I'm sorry for this terrible environmental statement, but paper is cheap. In other words, if you need to use more paper to make your score look better, then use more paper. Now let's consider staff size. The outer extremes are the problem on this page. So half a centimetre, it's too small. You just can't read that. 0.8 of a centimetre, you might think, well, it's nice and readable, but it tends to look like easy music. Uh, you know, it's too amateurish, looks too big. So between 0.6 and 0.7 are pretty good. For an orchestral part, the rule is 0.7. Um, but if you need to fit a bit more on your page to alleviate page turns, then 0.6 would be an acceptable compromise. Have a look at published scores and see what they look like. And you can see, for example, that there are spaces between the staves where you've got a split staff situation and using this, the uh, score divider here. There's also space in certain parts here. It's relatively cramped, but you can still see everything and you know there is just enough room to fit on the page on this published edition. So yes, look for the, uh, the, uh, um, the distance between different families and making room where it's required. Jumping forward to the next slide, um, you need to watch out for horizontal space. So in the first bar, there's too much. That last, the last one on the page, the bottom system, it's getting towards being too squashy. You could probably just about get away with it, but even still, you'd want to reduce the font size if you're going to have that many. And this is sort of in between, but perhaps also spread out. So actually, none of these is an ideal option. You'd need to tweak that page in order to get things to look slightly better. You need to make a judgment about that you need to spread things out more, squash them in in order to get page turns as well. So alignment, if you're doing handwritten scores, and handwritten scores can look really great. Then one of the dangers is not having things aligned properly. And you can see in this version, the vertical lines don't line up. So you need to use a ruler for that sort of thing. And so watch out for dynamics which are underneath the note heads. But the rule in vocal music is different and dynamics go above in pieces for choir and for voices. Um, here we go, that's been fixed up now and it looks much better. You can see that the, the dynamics are aligned both horizontally as well as vertically. For handwritten manuscript, it's a really good idea to use a ruler. And although that's kind of clear, bar line stems, beams, hairpins, that is crescendos and decrescendos, should be used as using a ruler. So this one is, you can see that the, the lines underneath have been ruled. They're slightly better. It looks a little bit more clear, but crescendos and decrescendos could be better still, couldn't they? But that manuscript, if you're using handwritten score, that's pretty good, that's clear enough. 
So another rule is fonts. It can be really confusing if you're using lots and lots of fonts. It can look really messy. So here are a few rules for you. So tempo indications, 14 or 18 point, depends on the size of your score. If it's an orchestral score, it might be larger. Um, and for tempo alterations, reach a tempo and so on, bold is good. You don't need italics for these ones. Sibelius generally gets this one right. And then uh, for your bar numbers, 14 point is a good idea in italics, as long as they're big enough. And again, when you're doing with larger scores, an orchestral score, you might want to increase the font size so the, um, it's legible. So just remember font size is something that you can change in your, uh, in your software. And then things like your crescendo mark, they should be italics. 12 or 14 point, again, just depending on, depending on the size of of your score, um, 12 points usually okay. Um, and the performance directions, 12 point plain, those ones need to be plain, whereas the other ones underneath are usually um, italics. Okay, have a look in the uh, Behind Bars book for a, a guideline on this. Here is an idea, it's not necessarily one that everybody needs to do but it's a useful thing, especially for draft scores, is to put your bar line under every uh, every bar. I've seen it also placed above every bar in scores. For example, in John Adams' score, we, they, they do that. Uh, the other rule is that it's always on the left-hand side. Um, the bar number is always on the left-hand side. And you'll see this in the parts. Okay, so bar numbers there. You also want rehearsal figures in your scores as well. So cues and parts, right, this is a big thing that you need to consider, is that when you're doing pieces for multiple players, they really need to know what each other are playing on occasions. So there's a big section in behind bars, I suggest you look that, look at that up, and how to select cues. Um, in particular, it's the instrument that's next door to the instrument that's playing. So if it's, if it's a clarinet and they're sitting next to a flute, you want to put the flute cue in rather than the violin cue. But it's also sometimes to do which is the music which is most similar or the music that is at the top line. Um, so I suggest you read this up, page 566 in be behind bars, um, and that's your bit of homework to do that and to start practicing putting in cues into your parts. Okay, here's another one, rehearsal letters. So when there's a significant change in texture, it's a good idea of, of putting in a, a rehearsal figure. If you put something in the middle of a section, a rehearsal figure, it's kind of annoying because they have to, because musicians have to then go, oh no, let's not go from X, let's go from two bars before X. Okay, it's, you need to think about how form of mind approach a piece of music and how they're gonna rehearse it. So think about the ease of rehearsal and, and it helps also, it can help you as a composer think about your structure and, and kind of delineate it in a, a visual sense. Page turns, my goodness, these are a nightmare. Um, the general rule is to try and put them around the longest available rests. Okay, so if you've got a rest of four bars in the middle of a page, then that's where it's probably better than having just a sort of a half a bar at the end of the page. So I have half a page of music in order to facilitate a longer page turn. Um, and this helps musicians a lot. If there are no rests, well, we're in trouble. Okay, multiple players. Sometimes you have two parts, two players per part. That might work. One-handed page turns. So think about what instrument's playing that and how they can do that. It's pretty hard with a, a violin, for example. And if that's the, if there are no rests at all, then you really need to think about more textual changes in your music. Maybe there's too much going on too much of the time. So here are some general points to note. So try and really look for this attention to detail in your scores. So make sure that there's a correct number of beats in each bar. Metronome markings, please. Score matching the parts. It's good to go back and, and double check. Now, gosh, uh, there is a special 
Sabaya is special with time signatures, that sometimes they go missing in parts, and sometimes there are too many time signatures, unnecessary time signatures, in both scores and parts. Uh, watch out for articulations, make sure you're consistent, the dynamics are always there, um, but pauses are in all staves, not just one. This is a big mistake students sometimes make, to put it in one part, and not all of them, because then the other instruments will just keep counting and keep going on. Rehearsal markings and cues, as we've noted earlier, page turns, you've got to think about if you're writing for an instrument with a mute, putting it on and putting it off. That's a pretty important thing for you to consider. Musical spelling. I'm going to let you read this next sentence. Okay, so I think you get the point. You can still read music which is spelt badly, but it makes it so much harder. So let's really think about getting good musical spelling into our compositions as good practice. So here's an example. Think about what notes fit vertically and what looks right in terms of the standard practice of music. So we would change the G flat to F in the first two bars. In the third bar, we would change the D flat to a C sharp so that it looks right. Okay, now that's a simple example. It can be much more complicated when we are writing in a less strictly tonal style. And be very aware of computers because they will do the wrong things if you don't force them to do the right note and it causes the reaction of that picture there. Ah, I hate incorrect spelling. Please fix yours in your piece. Here are some rules about spelling. So if you're using non-tonal music, and many of you will be doing various sorts of styles, then you should think about using the same sort of accidental, for example, mostly sharps. So here's an example of using only sharps for a passage. Here is another principle, and I think I like the second one better. Use voice leading principles. So try and fit the music into a chord, avoid the strange intervals, try and make it look as normal as possible. So music is going up, use mostly sharps, music is going down, use mostly flats. I like somewhere in between these two. I kind of like the, the descending passage here, but here I like this better. So I've given you a couple of options and you know sometimes you've just got to work which is which is the best. And you can also ask musicians and you'll get multiple opinions when you ask them things like this too. So it's, uh, it's something you should think carefully about. All right, finding errors and proofreading. This is very important. You need to be fussy. You need to check, double check and triple check. So one rule of thumb is to try and find a certain number of errors in any pass when you're looking through. So see if you can find four errors per page. And if you find that, great. If you don't find four errors, that means maybe you've found them. Okay, you can find some sort of rule like that, and that can be really helpful in your proofreading. You can also try and uh, offer to proofread your friends' scores and get them to do the same for you. And that a fresh set of eyes is probably the best way to do it. So here is a very flawed looking part and you can see there are a whole bunch of errors here. I'll leave you just to kind of scan this and have a think about what needs fixing. So here is a fixed version. Okay, so the, the contrast is quite interesting. For example, first of all, tempo. Here we go, much easier to read, it's in bold. We can read that much more clearly. The space between the staves is formatted nicely. And this is better. The horizontal layout is much better too. We can kind of comprehend this so much more easily. So let's go back. All right, now the first one is a bit smaller. So that's one thing, is getting the, the font size right. 
the number of bars here in each system is inconsistent. This is a disaster, needs spacing. And see things like this, like the row mark, the tempo mark, the tempos are not there. And we don't know what instrument is playing it. So there's quite a few things wrong here. Look at the bar numbers here as well. Okay, that need fixing. So let's look back at the corrected slide. Better here. Much bigger font and better print size altogether. The dynamics are, are set out better as well. Okay, so uh, there are some guidelines for you to have a think about with your own works and especially considering the parts. This is really important, guys. And uh, one final task for you to do is I would like a small task for you to find a piece of your own music and to insert some cues into the parts. Sometimes you need to create a separate file that has the cues put in. There are plugins in both Sibelius and, um, and Finale to create plugins. Um, I'm not sure what happens with Muse Score. Or if you handwrite, then you can handwrite the cues in the parts. Okay, for example, here would be a great place in this bar here to actually have a cue so that the player knows what is being performed, first of all. So read through the section beginning at page 566 in the Elaine Gould book for about 10 pages. Read through all of that very thoroughly and then see if you can apply some of those principles to some of your instrumental parts. Bring that along to class and then we'll take a look at how you're going with those cues. Also try it as you're rehearsing and getting your pieces into the rehearsal stage, putting in the cues. Maybe the musicians might suggest some to you and you can put them in for the final version of your piece. Okay, so good luck everybody with getting your final versions of your scores completed and looking forward to hearing your pieces and also seeing them in their beautiful notation.